All right, everybody, I am here with activist, author, former pastor, and public theologian, and of course, I would argue a philosopher, one of the brilliant <laughs> minds of our day, Brian McLaren. Brian, how are you? I'm very happy to be with you. Glad that, that Zoom is working and glad that we can communicate in this way. Oh, thanks for doing this with us. So traditionally, you have kind of been the controversial figure in Christianity. Your books have stirred up a lot of debate and have stirred up a lot of hatred from some circles and compassion and love from other circles. How is that today? Are you still mm -hmm. kind of feeling that? Yeah, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Uh, one man's orthodoxy is another man's heresy. So, you know, Martin Luther would get a, in a whole lot of trouble in Catholic circles, but when he's with uh, Lutherans who agree with him, he's just fine. <laughs> um, so what what happened to me, you know, I grew up fundamentalist, evangelical. I've got my cards for charismatic, punched, and Calvinist. So, you know, I've been in those sort of conservative, evangelical, conservative, Protestant circles uh, growing up. And uh, I, I asked some questions that weren't supposed to be asked there. And I, I opened up, you know, unscrewed some bottles that weren't supposed to be uh, opened up. And, and so uh, really, I would say ten, by 10 years ago, um, I was pretty much edged out of those circles. And, and so most of the people who read my books now are mainline Protestants, progressive or forward-leaning Roman Catholics, and then lots and lots of folks who, for whom evangelicalism isn't working. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't get that much attention. Yesterday, I got a very impassioned email from a young woman who just read one of my books, and she felt so bad because she agreed with me, and then she got to a point where she didn't. And she had to write me a very impassioned email, you know, to tell me how I'm leading people astray. So, you know, that sort of thing still happens, but it's, it's, she, she was doing what she needed to do. And so it doesn't bother me. I'm glad. I feel like that's how people learn sometimes is by arguing and voicing their objections. It doesn't sound like the heresy hunters are out to um, scold you and crucify you as much anymore. Well, I don't want to be too uh, glib, but, you know, they're all pretty busy supporting Donald Trump. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a distraction they don't need. They have, they have other witches to burn. I got you. <laughs> so uh, tell me about the Vote Common Good project that yes. you were with. What was going on with that? Is it over? And did you guys see anything from it? Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine, Doug Paget, after the 2016 election, started Vote Common Good, and it was a, a, and is a super important effort. Um, Doug realized that white evangelicals uh, had had given the election to Donald Trump, and you know, for people like me who care about the environment, who care about racism, who care about anti-Semitism, who care about uh, the growing gap between rich and poor, and so on. Uh, you know, Donald Trump has, is is a, a disaster, like an existential threat level disaster. So, um, and Doug felt the same way. So he wanted to try to reach out to white evangelicals and especially young white evangelicals and, and try to give them an opportunity to stop supporting Donald Trump and his uh and his allies. Joining us is Pastor Doug Patchett of Solomon's Porch Church in Minneapolis. He created an organization to make the religious left more visible and help Democrats learn how to court evangelical voters. Patchett also worked on behalf of the Obama campaign in 2008. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hey, good morning to you. So how have Republicans done a better job at courting evangelical voters? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, over the last 25 years, Republicans have made a deliberate effort to talk to religious voters and to speak to them in ways that motivated them and to give them attention. And we really believe that many evangelical voters in the United States who are really bothered by the Trump administration and by the Republican support of the Trump tactics and style really do want to find a new option. And if Democrats would reach out to speak with 
and spend time talking with evangelical voters, we're confident that a significant percentage of them would think about voting for Democrats in this next election. And so in the 2018 election, they planned an amazing thing. They did uh, a, a bus tour to 31 congressional districts. Uh, they started this as a 501c4. So it was a overtly political electoral organization. But they, they chose 31 districts. They went to those districts and advocated for, uh, and they were mostly Democratic, but they were all, uh, all candidates who offered a different vision that we felt was more just and generous and uh, healthy. And, uh, and uh, I, I did some writing for it. I w- wasn't able to be on very much of the campaign at all, but my, or, or, of the bus tour at all. But of the little bit of the bus tour I was on, I came away thinking, if we do this again in 2020, I would really like to be involved training candidates. Uh, helping candidates reach out to religious voters. And so since uh, late last year, um, I've had the chance to train maybe, I don't know, somewhere around 60 congressional candidates uh, and try to help them understand. Some of them Christian, some Jewish, some non-religious, but trying to help them understand white evangelical and white Catholic voters and how they can do a better job of reaching out to them. Now, Help me understand this, because you yourself are not an evangelical, not in the sense that the the same people who support Donald Trump. Right. So what kind of insight are you able to give to these candidates? Well, obviously, these are the people I grew up with. These are a a very high percentage of my relatives. Um, (laughs) You know, these are the people I wrote books for for a long time. These are the people who have been, you know, in conversation with me. Uh, for decades. So I, these are my people. I understand. I, you know, there's part of me that doesn't understand how, uh, how they could be supporting someone like Donald Trump. But there's another part of me that totally does. Uh, and, and, um, and one of the things that's, it, it's not, you know, rocket science, is to help uh, candidates who, let's say you think have a good uh, a good policy about the environment, that we actually ought to care about the environment and we ought to be more concerned about l- the long-term health of the planet, which is the source of the entire and the k- framework for the entire economy, than we are about the short-term economic return. Um, uh, it, it's not hard to make a biblical case for that, uh, for, for that concern. And so just giving, uh, giving candidates a little bit of guidance in that Uh, helps them. As well, you know, a lot of candidates, uh, this is the truth, they, all they've heard from religious voters is you're a baby killer, you're a communist, you're a leftist. They've really heard hateful kind of talk. And their impression of religious people would be really, really bad. Um, And when I, I and the others in our little team are able to help candidates understand where people are coming from, understand what they're afraid of, understand what they've been told. Um, it helps them understand. And I feel like we're doing a little good in that way too. We're building a little bit of better understanding. Now, being somebody who has been accused of heresy so much or accused of leading people astray, what do we think about Trump supporters, the white evangelicals? Are they kind of the new bad boys on the block? Are, are they the ones involved in, um, I don't want to say heresy, but yeah. is there a yeah. line where we say you're no longer Christian? Yeah. You know, I don't find that to be a useful line of discourse. I, I know whenever people told me I was a heretic, it didn't have the, it didn't have the effect of making me think, wow, I really would like to rethink my ways and be part of the group that's calling people heretics. You know, it, it, it's, it's a strategy that's meant to intimidate. And if you aren't going to be intimidated, it really becomes a kind of uh, counterproductive strategy. So um, would you argue that more uh, progressive Christians and mainline Protestants, that they need to stop attacking Trump supporters and start trying to reach out to them instead? Well, I, you know, if, if, if as a Christian, I, I'm to learn anything from Jesus, there was a time in Jesus' mind to use a term like whitewashed sepulcher or, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, he, he didn't hold back. Let's, let's just say it that way. Uh, brood of vipers, that sort of thing. But it, it, part of Jesus' brilliance and part of what just is, of the many things that are so attractive about him, he, he spoke in parables he, because he realized that people have, in, in the language of modern social psychology, people have biases. They have blinders. They have assumptions. Psychologists now call it confirmation bias and other kind of biases. And it's very hard for us to see things when the group that we're part of won't allow us to see it, or they threaten us with rejection and mockery, or worse, if we, if we don't see things the way they do, or if the way we make a living requires us to see things a certain way. It's very hard to see it differently. And so a parable was Jesus' way of getting a message through to people to help them gently ease into a different way of seeing. And uh, I think there's actually a lot of empirical research out there now that says, if you really want to help people change their viewpoint, don't attack them, don't call them names, don't argue with them, ask them a question, sincerely listen, genuinely be curious about what, what's the story that brought them to where they, to, uh, to see things the way they do. And then sometimes, uh, certainly not a foolproof method, there are none, but you can say, if you're ever interested in, well, I don't see it that way. If you're ever interested, I'll be glad to share with you. And then that can open into dialogue, but it's very different to have a person ask you, I am interested in why you see things that way. Very different than getting into, I'll lob my grenade, you lob your grenade, that kind of thing. Interesting. So earlier this year, the Evangelicals for Trump Coalition was formed and they held a conference so that different evangelical faith leaders around the country could gather together and pray over President Trump. I'd like to play a clip from that and kind of get some of your impressions from it. I want you to stretch your hands toward him, please. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you, Lord. We present our president. We come together from all denominations, all races together, as the Bible says, to pray for those in authority. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I pray for my president and our president. I pray for you to give him boldness. I pray, Father, for him to defy and challenge giants in the world and defy and challenge the enemies in this nation. Father, I pray for him and I raise them up in prayer. We come together in Jesus' mighty name. We believe we speak in his body. We pray healing. We pray restoration. We pray strength in his mind and his spirit all over his being. Be strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray right now for the Holy Spirit to invade this place. For the Holy Spirit, for the presence to experience the presence of the living God. We pray for that resurrected power of Jesus Christ. For him to say Jesus is alive. Father I pray all, of, all this together. We come together and we pray we stand with him. And what he's doing. And Father we give you the praise. We give you the honor. And Father we give you the praise and honor. And we ask you Father that he can be the Cyrus. To bring reformation. To bring change into this nation. And all the nations of the earth will, will say, America is the greatest nation of the earth. Father, I thank you. Use him this time. Release his power. I release the Holy Spirit upon his life. For the Holy Spirit to strengthen him. His spirit, soul, and body. And Father, I release wisdom from heaven. And I declare, God, that you use him to change the spiritual atmosphere of this nation. Father, I give you the praise. And I give you the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. All right. It reminds me of the churches that I, when I first converted to Christianity, I was in a very charismatic uh, Pentecostal church. And um, actually, it was more of the health and wealth prosperity gospel church. But yeah, yeah we prayed just like that. So what are your thoughts yeah. about this video? Well, I've been in a lot of those kind of prayer meetings myself. 
Okay, uh, well, first of all, what a great idea to actually do a little phenomenological research and uh, <laughs> actually, you know, observe and, and respond. Well, I'll, I'll just run through a couple of things and then any of them you want to pause on, we can pause on. You know, one of the things that I'm aware of in the world of evangelicalism and Pentecostalism is that an awful lot of activity is performance for a different audience than one who's present. Mm. So it strikes me that a group of religious leaders who get to have a meeting with the president telegraph the message back to everybody at home. Wow, our pastor's really important. Wow, our pastor's really effective. Wow, our pastor's with the movers and shakers. And, you know, the act of laying hands on um, has a lot of different meanings. But, you know, there's a certain feeling of dominance. It's almost as if these pastors are saying, we are, have power over the president. And uh, my goodness, that's, you know, to get him to submit uh, to their, you know, way of prayer is, is really quite remarkable. Uh, there's one moment in the video when, when Trump looks up and he looks like a mischievous little boy, like, what am I involved with here, you know? But he's playing the game. And to whatever degree it's a game, uh, I think a big part of the game is telling their donors, look what amazing, effective people we are. You give to us and we're close to the president and we are getting you, um, you know, deep connections. And this must be of God. And you can keep supporting us and having um, faith in us. Well, now, let me pause you there. So it kind of sounds like you're saying the thing is so much of a show that they probably don't even necessarily support Trump as much as they are doing this because it's. Oh, no, I think they sincerely support Trump. Oh, you I, do? I, yeah, I think they sincerely support Trump. But uh, the, an act like that, and, and in fact, one of the purposes of that is to make sure that everybody under their leadership supports Trump, too. But, you know, Trump, Trump is a deal maker. And, and I think a lot of pastors are deal makers, too. They, they learn, you know, there's, there's a fine line between being an evangelist, and I speak as a, you know, someone with that background, fine line between being an evangelist and a salesperson. And sometimes there's a fine line between being an evangelist, a salesperson, and a sleazy salesperson. And, and you know, whether it's Trump with Trump Stakes and Trump University, or any number of, you know, I think we're up to, I don't know how many thousand lies, 16,000, 19,000 lies now that are, you know, it, it, it's just obvious that that there's there are deals being made, and evangelicals are getting some things they want: access, visibility, uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, a, a resurgence of anti-gay feeling, which means an, an awful lot to people from that background. Um, a, a sense of men in charge and women uh, only given whatever freedom the men who are in charge over them are willing to give them. Um, so, you know, it's, there's a deal going on. We lay hands on you and you give us certain mm. deals back and deals with the people back home. One of the moments that really struck me in the, uh, in, in that prayer was when he says, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, quoting from the Lord's prayer. And of course, the great irony of this is that so many of Trump's policies go against everything Jesus taught. But not only that, the very next line in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, this is, goes totally against the Trump doctrine, which is if someone hits you, hit them back 10 times as hard. Even he was asked once, you know, do you ever ask for forgiveness? He says, I don't see why I would ever need to do that. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. I, I don't think in terms of, I have, I'm, I'm a religious person. Which is a great book. But have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. He certainly never admits he's wrong, even though he often is. And so the, the, the ability to do selective uh, surgery to say, that little phrase works for us. Let's stay away from the next one because it would be an embarrassment to the president. You know, this is just the kind of gamesmanship that goes on in, um, in politics. Well, what's interesting, though, is um, the prayer for 
Christ's kingdom to come. And then the pastor goes on to say, make America great, that oh my gosh. the world would know that America is the greatest nation. Praise and honor. And we ask you, Father, that he can be the Cyrus to bring reformation, to bring change into this nation. And all the nations of the earth will, will say, America is the greatest nation of the earth. Father, I thank you. you what a striking thing. What a striking thing. I mean, this just shows that underneath the paint of a certain kind of evangelicalism is white Christian nationalism and, and all that goes with that. And I, I'm not certain, but I, it, I think that the fellow who was leading in the prayer was a Latino brother. And, um, uh, and what is terribly ironic about this is that America is the greatest. America is the city on the hill. Uh, this idea of manifest destiny that goes back to the doctrine of discovery and uh, documents of Pope Nicholas V in the, in the 15th century that led to Columbus and the conquistadors and everything else. I mean, what this led to was the slaughter and enslavement of tens, if hundreds of millions of people. And, and, uh, and you, you, you take this to, to heart and then you think, what an amazing thing American exceptionalism is. What an amazing thing nationalism is, that, that it, it's able to win over the Christian church to its own ends. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised in this because just a few centuries into the Christian religion, Constantine was able to do something very, very similar. Uh, he, he was able to win the bishops over. He, get, he made deals with them. He gave them things they wanted, protections they wanted, favored status that they wanted. And uh, the, the religion changed remarkably in 100 years because of, uh, of deals uh, made there. I, I was so uh, interested when he, when he used the Cyrus motif, yes. uh, which, you know, if you know anything about the Bible, to, to call somebody Cyrus is basically saying, this person's a pagan, this person's evil, but God is using him. Uh, I mean, it's a very functionary way to, to pray for somebody, but this has become a whole meme in charismatic Pentecostal uh, and evangelical America. So uh, it's telegraphing a message to people. Uh, the, the only way we can legitimize this guy is, uh, is by Cyrus. I mean, it, I can think of a hundred biblical characters who would be way... Uh, closer connection uh, for Trump, Nebuchadnezzar being one of them. Uh, but anyway, there it is. You know. Interesting. That's good. So tell us about your upcoming book project. It's on doubt and faith. Go for it. Yes. Well, it's called Faith After Doubt. And um, it, it really gives me an opportunity to draw together an awful lot of things that I've worked with over the years. And, and, I, and the truth is, it's, it's affected by the fact that I wrote it between you know 2016 and today um, is you know the, what we're seeing going on in the world of religion gives a whole lot more people all kinds of reasons to doubt the validity of any kind of religion. And so uh, what I'm trying to do in faith after doubt, first of all, is help people understand why doubt hurts so much, why it's so difficult. Um, and then second, I offer a, a four-stage schema of understanding how uh, faith always involves doubt and how there are predictable kinds of junctures where, where doubt really becomes uh, critical. And then I try to talk about the kind of faith that survives uh, a baptism in doubt, if we could say it that way. And, uh, uh, and then I end the book by talking about how I don't think this is just a problem in religion. I think it's a problem across our civilization, that ways that our brains were wired, assumptions that we were brought up working with are now being challenged. And, and the struggle of being able to, well, here's an irony, the struggle of being able to repent or rethink and be born again, to, to have a fresh way of seeing uh, how how difficult that is. And uh, so I, I hope the book will be helpful for people who are doubting and for people who love somebody who's doubting. Mm. So it sounds like you would argue that doubt is not only a natural, but partly a healthy 
aspect to your religious faith. But does doubt end up becoming too much of a problem for religion in general, for the church at large, and on an individual believer's basis? Is there such a thing as too much doubt that leads to total abandonment of faith? Yeah, so I, I talk about this, how uh, in, in, the, in the process of doubt, many of us, just the tension of it gets too great. And we just decide to throw the whole thing out. And I, I understand why people feel that way. It's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. Uh, one of the reasons people feel that way is that it's hard enough to doubt. But then when you have to pretend that you're not doubting or you're not allowed to be honest about your doubts, now you have the problem is multiplied. I not only have doubts, but now I have secrecy and I have pretense. And man, it's, talk, it's hard enough to doubt, but it's, it's impossible when you have to be in a social setting where you can't even be honest about, about that. You know, that leads to all kinds of other problems. Um, but at one place in the book, I make the comparison uh, between doubt and chemotherapy. Um, uh, obviously, chemotherapy is not a vitamin, <laughs> um, but chemotherapy is really necessary if you have cancer. Well, all of us have misconceptions. All of us have false assumptions. Uh, all of us are wrong about some things. We, we might not know which things we're wrong about. That even makes it harder. So the ability to think critically, the ability to take a belief and suspend it and say, well, maybe that's not the only way to see this. That actually is, we, we have a word for that. It's called critical thinking. And, uh, and I think that critical thinking is really, really important, but I don't think it's everything either. And, uh, that's why in a number of philosophers in, in over the last hundred years have talked about a kind of critical thinking and then post-critical thinking. Uh, and that's what I'm really arguing for in the book, helping people uh, own their own faith background, their own faith journey, welcome critical thinking, but not let critical thinking be a kind of acid that burns away all value and all uh, meaning in their lives, but that there actually is a kind of faith that sends us on a quest in life. And, and you know, there's that verse familiar to a lot of folks who know the Bible in the book of Hebrews that says that um, if we want to have faith, we have to believe that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. In other words, that there really is that that this isn't just a game. There really is something worth seeking, and that if just for a person to say, I think it's worth seeking. That in itself, I think, is a is an act of faith. Let me uh, turn to the last subject. So, the thing that is on everybody's mind: COVID nineteen, the novel coronavirus. It has shaken our world up, and it's probably going to change religious communities, culture, society, so dramatically, we're not even sure um, what it's gonna look like, but we can bet a lot of changes are coming. When churches do open back up and congregations are filling the pews, is there something that you hope, not only churches, but all religious faith communities will have learned from this experience? Yeah, no question. Um, but before I say that, let me say, in, in relating to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, uh, you know, I was just talking to my friend Diana Butler Bass the other day, who's a historian, and she was saying that, you know, the Black Death, uh, you know, 14th century uh, and before, uh, or the waves of it that came through over the late Middle Ages, uh, it caused huge theological problems because the theological explanations for why plagues came before that said God brings plagues as punishment for evil and sin. Well, then these plagues come and people need somebody to blame for the evil and sin. And this results in horrible, horrible theology. And some scholars think it paved the way for modernity, that it was actually plagues that broke apart some of the old theological assumptions. I think some of that will happen, and I think it will intensify the experience of doubt for some people. I'm sad to say, I also think it will 
intensify an awful lot of ugly religious behavior, like who can we blame for this? Uh, you know, the, the anti-Semitism, anti-witch behavior, some of this has similar roots in response to unexplainable phenomena like a plague. Um, but if there's something that I wish we could learn positively, it would be the very opposite of what our president tends to do when he wants to call this the Chinese virus. It would be to say, we are all connected. Um, th this virus reminds us that all human beings, we're all susceptible to the same viruses. Being a Buddhist, being a Christian, being a Muslim, being a Jew, being an atheist, it doesn't save you from a virus. Uh, this has to do with being a biological entity on this planet. So suddenly we realize we are connected with all our fellow human beings. And, and it really has a message to say to people like us who grew up in a capitalistic environment, because we lived in this world where our brain in ways we aren't even aware of, I'm certain as much as I've thought about this, I don't begin to see how my brain has a class structure built into it. Um, and rich people matter more than poor people. So a whole lot of rich people think as long as I can get good health care, I don't care what happens to poor people. Well, in a pandemic, you find out, no, if a poor person gets sick, you, are, you, you can't build a wall that keeps the virus away from you. And, and so suddenly we realize how connected we are with each other. I think if that could go one step farther, we'll also realize how connected we are with the entire earth and with all of creation. That that we're all part of this one, uh, Dr. King called it a, a network of mutuality. And if we could, if we come out of this with that deeper understanding, that's going to serve us well. First, it's true. And second, it's going to set us up for the next huge crisis we face that I think makes COVID-19 look like the warm-up band, so to speak, and that's climate change. Uh, our connectedness is is becomes one of the <laughs> it becomes an element of faith that we have to come to terms with in a very deep way want to play a clip and this will be the last thing that we talk about of ohio state representative nino vitale and representative vitale here is justifying why he refuses to wear a mask during the quarantine or uh, went out in public. When, when we think about the image and likeness of God, that we're created in the image and likeness of God, when we think of image, do we think of a chest or our legs or our arms? We think of their face. I don't want to cover people's faces, Jim. That's the image of God right there. And, and I want to see it in my brothers and sisters. Okay. What are your, what are your reactions to that? Well, it's just a reminder that Catholics can, can be just as fundamentalist and just as misguided uh, as Protestants. Uh, it's a reminder. It, I mean, it's just silly. It's just silly and it's just sad. And whether he's sincere or he's just clutching at this as a way to use religion to make his point, I don't know which is worse. Um, they're both pretty bad. Uh, but it's just silly. Uh, I certainly didn't hear him say that about the NFL having wearing masks uh, in the NFL or in the NHL, right? Uh, uh, but it's just plain silly. Uh, and, and the idea that, that this would say that he thinks God literally has a face, um, it, this is just a reminder how so many people uh, have, have missed one of the fundamental truths about religion. This is a philosophy of religion statement. And that is that religion speaks in metaphor. Uh, metaphor is to religion what tones are to music, right? Note, what notes are to music. And, and he, he doesn't understand that to speak of God's face is to speak in metaphor. Uh, so it's, it's very, very sad, but it's just a perfect example of how religion ends up being used for all kinds of political reasons. Uh, and it sounds so sincere and, and its results can be so deadly. 
Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate you doing this interview, talking with us today. And uh, we really look forward to reading your book when it finally comes out. Well, thanks for the good work you're doing. And thanks for asking these questions. And, uh, you know, may, may we all uh, find ways to simultaneously engage our critical thinking and, and yet not be so foolish as to think that any of us will be able to cram the entire universe into our little, uh, our little heads. That to me, that holding that balance uh, to me is the great, great opportunity. Yeah. Amen to that. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Hey, keep up the good work, man.